for my kings. Never let your dreams outshine your work ethic. We were sipping lean even when we knew better. Had that Glock with the beam just to see who shoot better. Dirty pistol tucked to the weed. We was hot like summer sweaters. All for what? A couple extra bucks, a little cheddar, new J's for my kings, find new ways of income. No, this system was created for us to fail and then some. Young kings, I'm talking to you. Since we were youth, we were given choices to choose that made us age faster for my kings. Even if you were raised in a disaster, do not be a product of your environment. Let your environment be a product of you. Let's reshape our hood instead of vacate our hood because they love and hate our hood, but we make our hoods for my kings. Let's bear arms and learn our rights. When they disrespect our rights, like coming to our house and shoot us while we eat ice cream on our couch, or shoot us while we play Call of Duty with our nephews, or put their knee on our necks while we scream that we can't breathe, let's bear arms and learn how to fight. We gotta sacrifice old beef so we can choose life for our people. Stop the robbing and killing. Lord knows that's not love, that's evil. Run a bit, I said, stop the robbing and killing. Lord knows that's not love, that's evil. I won't sit and act like I've never been lethal. My name is B. Love, but you can call me Brandon Love. I grew up in Southside, Richmond, Virginia, right off Bainbridge Street. Uh, Southside, man, it's, it's, it's the home of the forgotten. It's the home of the abandoned. Abandoned buildings, abandoned houses, abandoned souls. It's a little bit of everything from drug abuse, drug dealers, to the killers. But it's home still, so they call it the Dirty South for a reason. Growing up, man, I, I keep it bands. I had a temp out this world, man. I was, I was angry. Angry at everything I saw. Angry at, at my relationship with, with the people around me, relationship with different family members. Angry at <laughs> watching the crackheads beat the hookers next door. Angry at the trash on the streets. I was angry, man. I was, I was very angry. But um, at the same time, I was blessed because I had, I had a family. In the midst of the storm, in the midst of Southside, in the midst of the war, in the midst of the, the dirt, I had something that a lot of my peers didn't have, which was a loving family. But at the same time, even with the loving family, I seen so much trauma and so much pain between my parents. You know what I mean? From the fights, to the, my dad not coming home, to the, you can call it infidelity, whatever you want to call it. I just saw a lot, you know what I'm saying? See my first body in the, in the alleyway. I didn't know if he was dead or if he was high, but his body won't move. <laughs> then I heard them gunshots and I just ran back in the crib. So, you know what I mean? Grew up to the, the gunshots put me to sleep. I grew up on a real busy street, so it was car driving past, night after night, feds posted on the corner. So yeah, that was just, it was, it was very loud growing up in the city. For lack of better words, it was loud, a lot of noise. Wasn't that much peace and wasn't that much quiet, but again, I felt peace in knowing that I did have a family, something that a lot of people didn't have. Even when the lights was off, even when the water was off, even when we didn't have the clothes, even when I was getting the hand-me-downs from family members, I felt peace knowing that I had something that most people didn't have and that was a family. So that's why I found my peace at. I'm, a, I'm in your neighborhood Seymour slander, baby, you know what I'm saying? Like, I create poetry, man. I get booked for doing spoken word. I'm a hip-hop artist. I mentor you from my city, man. Like, like I, I, just, I just be, I be love. Again, my name is Be Love because my message is to be love. I like to tell people to become love. There's love with two E's because if you take that last E, you put it between a B and the L, you have my message. So every day I wake up and I find ways to tell people to be love. Tell, tell people to find your strength. Find your passion, find your purpose, find ways to heal yourself mentally, spiritually, emotionally, physically, financially. Find new ways to hustle. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I trapped a little bit growing up as most, most people did, most people in my, my neighborhoods did, but I found new ways to hustle, found new ways to make money. I sell my books, I sell CMOS, I sell CDs, I sell myself as an artist, and most importantly, I teach the youngest in my city how to do the same thing. I teach the youngest in my city that it's, it's a million ways to make a million dollars. And you don't have to just 
follow the, the resources that's placed at our feet. You know what I mean? Because the resources and stuff that's usually getting us out of locked up or thrown in jail. So yeah, man, right now, man, I, I host meditation sessions in, in the middle of Southside, right in the middle of Bra Rock, teaching people how to breathe, teaching people how to focus on, on internal peace and internal healing. I slang vegan food, I slang vegan cheese with my people's rooted delights, teaching people how to heal themselves physically, how to choose to eat to live and not just to eat for pleasure. You know what I'm saying? Again, with the books, I really teach mental health, I teach creative writing. How to use creative writing as a self-de-escalation technique to deal with everything that you're going on, to deal with your trauma. So yeah, man, I focus on mental health, spiritual health, physical health, and hustling. How to hustle, how to make bread, how to eat, and how to, how to sustain yourself and how to sustain your dreams. So yeah, that's what I do, man. Spread love, spread love the rich way, and, and show people there's a thousand ways to, to be yourself and really find yourself and find your passions and love yourself and love your passions. So that's me, man, that's what I do. I swear, man, this world, this system that we're in, it, 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 it paints a picture of what we should be from the movies that we see, from the, from the images that we see in our neighborhood. It says, oh, we gotta be like this, we gotta move a certain way, we gotta talk a certain way. But at the same time, you can, you can create, you can become who you were designed to be. Living out your purpose. Again, for me, being myself is finding my passions. Loving my strengths and my weaknesses. Loving my pains, my trauma. You know what I'm saying? Again, really finding out what makes you you, what sets you apart from the rest. And choosing, really choosing to be that, that you. Respect. Respect. <laughs> but that's it, man. Again, you're showing love, man. Realizing that we are all reflections of each other at the same time. Realizing that we all got the same story just written in a different way. So yeah, me for me again, finding myself and being myself is not being what this system chooses to label me as. You know what I'm saying? Really standing out from the most. Standing out from, from my environment. Being a part, not, not being a product of my environment, but letting my environment be a product of me. So for real, man, like I said, creativity, creation, positivity, but also understanding it, understanding the balance and everything. Understand that you can't always be love is not just oh light and daffodils and, and going to pick some lilies and meditating in the garden. No, you gotta keep that thing on you too. You gotta make sure that you protect it. You gotta protect yourself, you gotta protect your family, you gotta you gotta protect your legacy. So for me, man, being myself again, loving myself is really tapping into my mental, my spiritual, my physical. And again, realizing that my neighbor and my neighborhood is just a reflection of me. And I can't really truly distance myself and disconnect myself for what made me me, for my experiences and my growth. So yeah, man, just, just being me, man, not being what this system wants me to be. And what this system sells, tells me to be in. And using the tools that, that are inside me, that the creator, the most high has, has given me to my melanin through my creation, through my beauty, through my skin tone, through my locks, my antennas, really being me. And again, it's not conforming to the way of this world. Now's the time I visualize the world clearly like it's see-through. I'm just being transparent. There's too many women playing both roles. I'm talking transparent. See, it's a parent that it's a parent wearing jail clothes or church clothes somewhere down in the hole. For my kings, I'll die for you. Better believe it. If you have goals, go and achieve it. For my kings. Shout out to the Royal Refuge. I said, it's okay to be vulnerable. You ain't a bitch if you cry. You ain't weak if you smile. The only time you lose your crown is if you follow in the crowd and that crowd ain't going nowhere but down.
All right, so uh, I am Malik Radford. I am from Richmond, Virginia. So growing up black for me was actually pretty interesting. I was reflecting on this um, a couple days ago. So the idea of being black actually never dawned on me until I got to middle school. Cause I was wondering at what age did I start thinking about race and identity? And so growing up black for me was Personally, I think it, I was, I had the bit of a more privileged uh, lifestyle than some, like than others. Uh, I grew up, despite like growing up in a single parent household with my mom, she was uh, able to put me through private school from kindergarten to f uh, sixth grade. And so, um, like my experience as a kid was, uh, it was, I feel like it was, I guess it could be di different from some uh, from others, but it was it was cool because my private the private school I went to it was a Catholic school, but it was predominantly black, which I didn't it didn't dawn on me that like Catholic school was typically a predominantly white thing until I got older, and uh, it was really when I got to sixth grade. So from kindergarten to fifth grade, I was in a Catholic school, and in sixth grade I went to a Christian school which was completely opposite from what I was experiencing at this Catholic school. But it was mad interesting because outside of school, growing up like in a black household, I went to, like my mom brought me up in the church and we were like, I guess, non-denominational or Baptist. So it was like, I was Christian, but like experiencing the Catholic experience majority of my like childhood. And then when I got to the sixth grade, I started to, I guess, l learn more about the religion that my family, I guess, attributed their our family to in a sense. And then I realized like, that was a really shitty experience. And so <laughs> it was, um, I was, sixth grade was when I first came into the realization that like, oh, I'm black and that makes a difference for people who look oh. like me. Um, predominantly white school. Um, there were maybe like five black kids in my class of like maybe 16 to 25 students. Um, so I had, I had a friend group and one of my, like my best friend in the class was actually the, the superintendent of the school's son. And so he kind of had like diplomatic immunity. Like he could kind of just do whatever because like your dad is like the head of the school and the church that the school was connected to because again, it's a Christian school. So. Uh, so there was a, t like, I remember this, like, vividly as fuck. So I was in the sixth grade in my science class, and he and I, he, like, wrote me a note or something, and he was, like, he called me, he, he said some, like, dumb shit. Like, I think he called me a bitch or something, but we were just joking, so I didn't even take offense or nothing. It was, like, innocent as fuck. And he passed a note, and it, like, didn't make it to me. Like, he threw it to me, and it got, like, caught in the middle of the room. And so the teacher saw it and was like, all right, who wrote the note? No one's gonna snitch. So uh, they ended up doing this whole fucking investigation almost where like they had us like leave the room and we had to, we had to give them our crayon boxes and they literally like analyzed our handwriting. They tried to match up the handwriting and the, the pins that we used to see who really wrote the note. And I'm an artist, I have good ass handwriting. Not every artist has good ass handwriting, but like, I came from private school, like they had handwriting as a class, so I knew my handwriting was phenomenal as shit. His was trash, the note had trash handwriting, but they didn't want to put blame on him because the head of the super, like, you know, the superintendent's son, no one's gonna, he doesn't get in trouble, what the fuck is that? So, like, it was a whole situation where they were willing to, they were gonna, like, suspend me and almost have me repeat the sixth grade, because this happened, like, towards the end of the year, so they were like, if you get suspended now, you're gonna have to repeat the sixth grade or some shit. So my mom, she was pissed and she she saw it as like, a, well, y'all aren't gonna put it on him because this white kid versus this black kid, y'all are gonna put it on him. I didn't see it like that. I just thought it was a weird situation. And so from there, she took me out of private school and was like, okay, let's put you in public school where you can be around people who are more, you know, just like you. And so you can kind of just develop, I guess like better just like social skills to be able to, um, my mom was really big on adapting and being able to uh, go between, she referred to it as going from the beach to the boardroom. So 
she, she really just talked about the importance of being able to communicate and build connections with like people from your, you know, from your culture and people who look like you and also being able to communicate with those who don't because that's a way to essentially connect bridges or I guess, I guess that's the term, build bridges, connect, I don't know, just bringing people together and so I think with that it's kind of piloted me into this this idea that as a black person, I do take pride in who I am as a black person, but I also take pride in who I am as a human. And I want to be able to, to bring people together despite color, because at the end of the day, that's not the, that's not the most important thing that we should be focusing about. Like there are way more important things that we should be focusing our energy into but being that race is such a critical part in our everyday society is something that I feel I should be able to not necessarily resolve, but at least try to help like solve the issue in a sense. Even if it's something like on a super small level, like just talking to a white person and like not, I don't know, not feeling some sort of animosity despite what's going on outside or like just trying to have a conversation that either opens my eyes to their perspective or hopefully opening their eyes to my perspective where there's just general understanding because at the end of the day I just want people to understand each other. So eighth grade uh, my art teacher had presented the opportunity for students to apply to specialty centers throughout the, the district and um, there was a center for the arts uh, that was designated at Michael High School and so he suggested I apply. I did, my mom thought it was a great opportunity and so uh, I got in and yeah, that's when uh, high school was when I really decided, okay, this art thing is where I'm gonna, this is where I'm at. Um, the journey's been cool as fuck. I was fortunate enough to, the program, the program was a really awesome, experience and opportunity and I think about how grateful and honestly blessed I am to have been able to be a part of it so um and it's interesting with identity like the my journey has all it's my journey has been like going between black and white rooms so the the center for the arts because it was artistic but at, in a black school or in a, in a black county or district it brought people from all different areas to this to this place and so like my art classes and the classes that were infused with uh, the center so like if I had an English class it would also be infused with art so it would be like art infused English art infused math art infused history stuff like that and so those classes were it was interesting because it kind of it kind of brought my experience from public school and private school back together again because now I see myself in these classes where yeah there are people who look like me but now there are also people who don't look like me and now they're kind of the minority in this sense so it's like it's a weird position to be well not weird but it's a it's an interesting position to be in because now I'm seeing it from okay at one point I was with all of my people now I'm at, I was at a point where I'm hardly with any of my people and I'm in this situation or I'm in this environment where I don't recognize, you know, people. And then I go back to this place where I'm just with all my people again. And now I'm in this new space where the unfamiliar faces are now the minorities. And so it, uh, it was dope being able to translate my my learnings from my sixth grade experience dealing with like the racism at my Christian school and I guess applying that knowledge to how I interact or how I interacted with my white friends in high school um and I'm not saying like it wasn't like a oh because of sixth grade I hate white people and going to high school made me hate white people less or it's nothing like that it just it just helped me kind of just develop a relationship or a rapport with people who don't look like me and um, just help me better understand that like 
we're all humans at the end of the day. Um, and not everyone has, uh, you know, like prejudgments of people. Some people just, they're trying to live and don't really know what's going on. And sometimes it's up to us or those who are informed to inform the uninformed, whether it is a comfortable situation or not. But I'm digressing. So high school, um, I learned a lot about formal art and just like the technical skills of what it takes to be a true artist. Uh, both of my teachers had come from kind of like fine art backgrounds. Um, so they were really big and they were white. <laughs> so they were really big on just like the fine art uh, side of the art, the art world and like what it takes to really fit in to that, to that niche. And it was really, I thought that was really beneficial because I didn't look at, I didn't think about it back then, but I was just like, yo, these artists have been in like the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts or they've showcased work in these places where it's predominantly white people eating cheese and drinking wine all night. Like that's, and it, 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 made, me, it made me have hope that like I could be in that position, even though I didn't see myself as, the, you know, I'm black. So it's like, I didn't even look at it as like, oh, I can't do it because I'm black. It's like, oh, I can do this because I'm an artist. Like, I know how to get in this because they taught me how to, if that makes sense. So, ooh, that's a good one. Okay. Um, so I feel like my role as an artist in the times that are happening now, um, it's kind of interesting because as an artist, I do feel a sense of like entitlement to speak on the issues that are going on. Um, but I also feel as an artist, I have flexibility and choice to decide when to vocalize through my work. Because uh, personally, I like to, as of now, I like to focus more so on like humor in my work. And these times have been very, it's been really interesting. It's been a lot of like reading the room situation. So as of late, I've been trying to trying to find a, a gap or a, a space where I can tell stories of what's going on now and it not be I just I, and it not be offensive or it not just be like kind of categorized into like all the other political art that is kind of being pushed out right now. Because one thing that I really push or I really try to focus on is what's something that's going to make me stand out. Because it's really easy to it's really easy to come to a common understanding and then just doing something. But it's like what there needs to be something else that makes I don't know. I just want people to like think a little bit more <laughs> and to just see my stuff and just go like. What does he mean? And even if it makes them feel uncomfortable or if they get, or if they, if they like read my work and they assume something bad about me, like that's, that's okay. <laughs> it, Cause it's all about interpretation. Like I make work that I, I try not to put a filter on my work at all. Um, like there, there was a recent piece, uh, I entitled it The Underdog Story. And it was a picture of like a Sambo type black cartoon character uh, boxing a Klansman and I was hesitant about putting that out because I didn't like I've gotten pieces I've done like much to me much more PG-13 rated pieces and people have like gone in uproars about it but this piece was surprisingly taken I guess m more like I guess better than like some other pieces I've done in the past um but I, I was hesitant because uh again these times are tough and it's like i don't want to actually no fuck it i want to i want to come i want to be i want to show that i'm for my people because i was about to say like i don't want to come off as like biased but i, I gotta be biased because it's it's my people at the end of the day and i want to i want to talk about the bias point because i was it's interesting being an artist and being, not saying I have influence, but I've, I've gained a following over the, over the past years. And so people have been telling me like, yo, you need to, you need to like, you know, start to like filter what you say or like be aware that like, you know, people are watching you. And it's like, I feel that, but at the same time, 
I am not working towards the goal of being someone that everybody loves. I just want to be able to make my stuff. And if you like it and you're able to see it, like, by all means, see it and enjoy it or don't. But like, so yeah, I was gonna, cause I was thinking like, I have to be able to satisfy, you know, my, the people who, my supporters, but at the end of the day, that's their choice if they want to support you or not. So yeah, nah, I'm biased. I gotta, I gotta stand up for my people, you know? Like, I, I made that piece because I've been doing a lot of reading just on uh, American history and uh, just trying to be more woke <laughs> or just socially aware because there's a lot of fucking shit going on. And I know, like, I feel like people know that there's a lot of shit going on, but I'm trying to get into like the psychology behind this shit. And so that piece was influenced just by my readings, uh, just on like the psychologies of America and like race in America. And it was essentially just telling the story of like, how there's this, it seems like this never ending battle between black and white. And I know that there's other colors involved, but I'm focusing on the black and white story. And it seems like no matter what we go through, we don't, we can't be truly defeated, but we're always taking hits. And it's super fucking annoying because it's like, when is that shit gonna stop? And yeah, it's just, it's, it's just a weird ass cycle. And it's trying to, and I'm trying to, I feel like with that piece, I was just trying to maybe get people to think about that and how it's a cycle, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and how it's a cycle and like maybe just getting them to think about like how the shit that I portrayed is like still happening today, even though it's not like, it's not as black and white as the, the pieces. Like, you know, we don't have KKK members walking around in their fucking hoods and shit in broad daylight. And we don't have people where we don't, we don't depict African American or black people as Sambo characters anymore. At least I hope not. So for those who don't know, Sambo is a, it's an, it's an old ass American racist ass personification of a black person. Um, you might be familiar with like the story of OJ or if you've just seen like any of like the, the, <laughs> the, the offensive Louis Tune shit. I'm sure people have seen it online, but just like, just depictions of black people in like Looney Tunes or, uh, or anything that was kind of coming out in that era, uh, that's referred to as like a Sambo figure. Or, I mean, it's not even just like cartoons, but like they've, mm, it, it's, you just gotta look it up, it's really, it's deep. It's, it's fucked up. Ooh, that's, ooh, you gonna make me go deep again. Okay, 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 okay. So, one minute. All right, bet. So, to me, black is, black is, what we as the descendants of American slaves have come together and we've cultivated this, we've cultivated this form of identity that transcends so many different mediums of life. <laughs> And it's, it's to the point, like, I, I feel like we've, it's so unique that it's, I mean, it's, it's black. <laughs> like it, it, it's cultivated its own name. Um, and it, it's just come from the, the centuries of what we've had to go through in order to just be deemed human beings. It's, uh, it's, that, it's that whole, what, turn what diamonds pressure from diamonds or something and like uh what's the <laughs> oh, yeah, is it cold is it cold to diamonds what is, what's the what's the, the there you go yeah, no. okay so it, it's that like it's just you know where you go through a lot and then you finally start to see something come to light and it's like oh shit that's what this is all about and i think that's what black is
Yet note this, even when you hit rock bottom, there's only one way to go, and that's up. So let's smoke, and the clouds lies your throne. Let's blow away and find hope. I was chiefing on a backwood off a of broad rock when I wrote this joke. Check it. My name is Ayana Love. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. Man, we like moved kind of all over the city, but like I probably had my longest stint in North County, which is like the Ferguson Florissant area. It's like where I went to middle school and like walking around and all that, and like where I lived for like most of high school. It was interesting, like it's a cool city and I would say it's pretty diverse, but it's like very segregated, like straight, black, white. I mean, I don't know if y'all ever heard like the Del Mar Divide, but it's literally like one side of the street, rich white people, one side of the street, poor black people. And so like, we used to experience like a lot of racism. Like even when I was in elementary school, like my first encounter, I remember we had a neighbor across the street and like, she was racist to the point, like she used to leave like KKK pamphlets on our like yard and like on our front doorstep. And there's just like this crazy, just, I don't know, just like a lot of like really passive aggressive things like that. And then by the time that I got to high school, I went to a predominantly white private school. And man, that was like, that was when I really encountered like true racism for like the first time. like from the teachers to the students. Like, it was only 150 people in our class and they would invite the whole class to a party except for like the five black people. So it was just constantly, I don't know, like constantly balancing between like what I was because you know, my mom's white and my dad's black. And so when I was in elementary school and middle school and I went to predominantly black schools, I was white girl and I was soft and I got made fun of. And then I got to high school and I was black and I was invited like nowhere and I was getting racial slurs and I was ugly and all this other stuff. And so it was just like a weird, like, I, just, I always caught hell like on all sides of it for real. And so it's weird because so when I was in high school, my best friend, her name was Alicia, she, and she was dark-skinned. And we used to both experience racism, but she caught it like way worse than I did. So like, I always had this complex where like, I never felt like I could feel too bad, because at least I wasn't getting it as bad as like some of my other black counterparts. Like, at least when we would go to like football games and stuff, like, you know, I would get approached by dudes more, not because she wasn't beautiful, like, personally thought she was more beautiful than I was, but like simply just because of like all this colorism and but then at the same time like when I was like around my white friends like then I was just like the black girl and so I don't know I just always kind of like navigated this like weird like middle area where I just I don't know, I just never really associated with none of it, honestly. I actually came to Richmond because I originally, so I'm an artist, and I originally came to the art school, because um, you know, it's like a really good public art school, and so I moved all the way from St. Louis to go here, and just didn't have a good experience. Um, I felt like, I felt like my voice was like really being stifled there, or they were trying to, they wanted me to have a certain voice that just wasn't mine. Like, I don't have a problem talking about black issues or highlighting things about being a woman, but all of my professors being white men, I felt like they only, they only wanted to see that work that was me pretty much exploiting my oppression on either side. And I honestly didn't even feel like I was learning that much. And so I ended up dropping out of art school, but then I just, liked the East Coast and I liked Richmond and so I just stayed and I've been here since except for a little six month stint in Atlanta but it's different kinds of racism like the racism that you experience in Richmond like if there's a racist they're a blatant racist like they're gonna wave their flag and tote their guns but St. Louis is all real passive racism like They'll make sure that you know that you're unwanted, but they do it in all of these really slick, systematic ways and kind of like under the breath ways, like 
trying to think of some examples. Like this is like seems like a small thing, but it's just like a personal experience. Like when I was in high school, I'll never forget this. Like we had this one teacher who was like consistently racist to us. Like he made comments even in the class telling us like, yo, I'm afraid of my African-American students. Like if there's too many of them around me, like a teacher in the middle of class. And I remember we had this group project where it was me and two other black students and a white girl. And it was like, um, it was this project where we had to kind of make a game. And so we made this game and like, you know, I was an artist and so we took it to like the next level, making it all creative and stuff. And he obviously liked the project enough that it became the project that he showed to like all the prospective families and uh, parents and stuff. But when the grades came back, me and all the other black kids in the group got a C and we did all, me and, me and one other dude did all the work and we got all C's and then the white girl got an A. And then when we went to the dean about it, they were like, well, there's nothing we can do. He has his reasonings, X, Y, and Z. And so it was always things like that where they just put us down in these passive enough ways that we could never like blatantly put our finger and say, oh, this is racism, especially to white people who just like weren't really seeing it. But I don't know, it was just really, it was discouraging for a really long time. So I feel like the only thing that's really different here is and this could just be because we're in Richmond, because like we're downtown near the campus, and like so it's just kind of a different vibe. Um, but I see more white people and black people actually interacting and being friends and like doing things together, where that just wasn't as much a reality in St. Louis. Like you, there really just was a divide where everybody just kind of stayed in their groups and. If there was some type of racism doled out to like a black person, you didn't have as many white allies as I feel like you do here. Um, but like I said, that could just be like this kind of more liberal downtown Richmond area. But the way it, it's kind of translated in my art, it's funny because like when I was younger, I used to be way more political in my art. Like I used to be like diehard activist. Like I was out there in Ferguson, like. I was like drawing, like painting like pigs and cop uniforms, like the whole nine. And I, I just kept feeling like I was just like a voice, like screaming in a void. And I realized that there were just so, there were so many deeper problems than just race. I realized like a lot of the problems that white people were having with black people wasn't just about them not understanding us it was like a heart problem like they were genu genuinely hurt and broken themselves and they were looking for somebody to put that off on and so like in my art now like I'm a very devout Christian like I so I talk about a lot of spiritual things in my artwork my whole theory is that if you can fix the heart first and you can just heal people first then like everything else is a symptom whether it's poverty whether it's racism everything else just boils down to people just being hurt and broken and feeling like they have this emptiness which I believe is what God is supposed to fill so I just like honestly try to push the message of Christ as much in my work and then I feel like that envelops everything else for myself and I also think Christ was black so I tried to pick that a lot in my work but yeah I feel like being black is like it's almost like you got a little more magic in your soul. Like, it's like, if we're all cakes, and I don't know why my brain went to this metaphor, but like, if we're all like different pastries and cakes, like we just got a little more sugar, like just a little more spice. And like, it translates into everything, like the music, the artwork. And I think it comes from historically, like our different struggles and the way that we've had to fight just, makes you a, a deeper stronger person but even when we experience joy like I feel like our joy is even greater than those of other races simply because like we've had to work harder to be joyful we've had to work harder to have our art and our music heard and seen and so I think everything we do just like has this like also this elevated spirituality of it <laughs> For my kings, keep this. You can't let your drugs be your saviors. 
You can't let your queens be your saviors. We must save ourselves through self-love, mind, spirit, and body. A trinity you will become for my king. My name is James Harris, Richmond, Virginia. I'm a father, I'm a veteran, uh, multi-entrepreneur, multi-homeowner. Um, I'm a therapist as well. Founded a movement called Men to Heal, which focuses on men's overall wellness, that mental health as well as that physical health. And as early as uh, April, I became an author. My book is called Man Just Express Yourself, which is an interactive guide for boys, young men, older men to better express themselves overall, dealing with their emotions, um, fears, and debunking different stereotypes within society that the different boundaries have been placed upon men. Our oh, childhood growing up was interesting, man, to be honest with you. It's, it's probably a story of resilience and tenacity. Um, so my father died when I was about five or six, and my mom got sick uh, with epilepsy, and uh, she had multiple strokes. Um, starting when I was probably eight or nine. So at that time, um, well, pre, pre, way before eight or nine, but at eight or nine is when I started to assist more around the house, having raised my younger brother and my sister. Um, but that's either here nor there. So moving forward, by the time I was 11, um, my mom couldn't take care of us no more. I think she had a, a stroke or something that was unresponsive. So. Long story short, the state stepped in and me, my brother, and my sister wind up going to a foster care. Um, so foster care, that didn't work out uh, based on some issues with the foster family we were placed with. Um, so then we went to a group home, which was unfortunate because me, my brother, and my sister at that point had to be separated. So I was in one group home, my brother was in one, and my sister was in one. Uh, we remained to be close-knit. but. It, it still was difficult based on just that, uh, you know, the things that taking place. Um, so from there, man, I decided to emancipate myself at 16 years old. So, you know, I decided that I can pretty much be on my own and, and start my own journey. Um, and at this time, social services and being a ward of the state, when you turn 18, you age out anyway. Um, so for me, I just, had a vision to like, let me just get ahead of it. Let me just do my own thing. You know, I probably was stubborn, but I also felt that I can do more on my own without the restrictions of a facility such as a group home. Um, so initially I grew up in Creighton Court. Um, you know, we lived there up until I was probably, up until we went to the foster care home actually. So in foster care though, I bounced around a lot. I went to three different middle schools. I went to Mosby, is now MLK. I went to uh, Chandler, which is now like community or something. And I went to Thompson, which is like a mix of school, Elkhart Thompson or something like that. Uh, then I wound up going to Franklin Military for high school. Um, so I lived in pretty much everywhere throughout Richmond. I lived in um, all of those places which led me to go to those different schools, North Side, West End, um, South Side off JD, just so many different places just based on the unstable living. Um, I decided to go to Franklin Military because it was more stability and, you know, they issue uniforms so I didn't have to worry about dressing a certain way or fitting in and I was working so the money that I obtained from working was able to contribute to my brother and sister who went to regular public schools and had to uh, worry about different things such as, you know, dressing a certain way and, and having needs met um, in addition to what social services was or wasn't, wasn't doing. I was able to afford them that opportunity. I uh, got into entrepreneurship. So from, from 16 to freshman year of college, 18, 19 years old, I was homeless. So I was house hopping. I was sleeping in hotels. I always had a job and I had a car. Um, so I was fortunate then. So freshman year, I went to St. Paul's College, which no longer exists, one of the oldest HBCUs in the country. Um, one male dorm, one female dorm. So as a freshman, I stayed on campus uh, in the male dorm. And my room was literally right there by the steps as soon as you walk in. So I was fortunate. So 
Mind you, I'm still homeless, you know, well, no physical address. So on spring break, winter break, summer break and stuff like that, I'd go back and sneak in the dorm room. I had a microwave in my car, I had a foreman grill in my car and a fridge. So I moved all that stuff back in while people was going home on breaks. Um, so sophomore year, I decided that I don't want to do that anymore. And that's when I joined the military. Um, did eight years army, two deployments, one in Iraq, one in Afghanistan. So my first deployment was in Iraq and that was 2007. This was during the time that deployments were 18 months now. I think they're a year max. Um, anyway, so I was on the deployment and came home on leave. So coming home on leave like halfway through, I think I had maybe eight or nine months down, started the process to get my house built. Um, still own the house, it's in Colonial Heights. It's three bedroom, two bath. I picked that area specifically because I knew like it was just the beginning. I'm gonna either rent it to college students at Virginia State, or I'm gonna rent it to a family at Fort Lee, or I'm gonna figure it out from there. So that's why I got to build there. Um, so finished, I started that process, went back, finished my tour. Uh, so like a month or two after my tour was complete, um, my house was completed at that point, you know, so moved in, excited, all that. So pretty much, I guess at age 22, when I first got the house built, was my story, my start into entrepreneurship. So from there, it's just been so many other opportunities. Now I have uh, four properties, um, five personal businesses, and like 16 or 17 investments between North Carolina, Virginia, up to D.C. Um, you know, some of them I can discuss and some of them I got NDA with, so I can't really talk about, but, you know, I'm just out here, man, trying to assist other people and, you know, just put them in a position to further their goals and our dreams. And if I can be in a better situation to, uh, you know, get my financial means and take care of my daughter. So it's all important to me to ensure that people are financial literate, financial literate as well as have access to, to certain things. Yeah, so access and availability is definitely important. Um, so one of my businesses is the Healing Hub. I do my outpatient out of there, but pre-COVID, it was so many different resources, uh, weekly yoga, weekly Zumba. And one of the things that I did do was bring in different experts from different fields um, to do different seminars. So we had a seminar on credit. We had a seminar on restoration of rights, financial literacy, first time home buying, uh, just bringing people different access to information specifically in our demographic that we normally are not privy to um, or don't know where to go to get those things. So it's so many people right now that can afford a home uh, but don't know the steps to get a home or don't know how to clean up their credit or don't know that they got uh, the credit score at a minimum to obtain their home. So for me, it definitely was important to put these things under one roof. Um, now in COVID, you know, things are shifted a little bit. So we got to do more of a virtual side. So um, I'm, I'm planning and, and strategizing how I can still deliver that stuff to the community. I mean, I don't think it's intentional, to be honest with you. We have to understand that uh, the information is provided. We have to decide decide on which information is credible. Um, you know, because all information is not good information. Um, and, and to be honest with you, the way our parents were raised, or the way certain generations were raised, it was more of a um, individualistic concept opposed to a collective concept because just think about it, like if you're older than I'm 34 so if you're a generation or two above me it was still you just being integrated or just tad bit far from segregation you know what I'm saying so for, for a lot of people it was oh man we get to do certain things now we get to obtain certain things now so let me get as much as I can and they weren't in a position of sharing as much resources just based on being allowed to own or have access to certain things so you got to remember just think about how it was historically from when we were segregated it was more of a collective stance of individuals having a bank right there, you had a shoemaker right there, you had your own barbers, your own everything, but now segregation, like well, integration, um, afforded African Americans or other minorities the right to shop at places that they couldn't normally shop at or be in, and it, it 
it was a detriment to specifically our community because we stopped funding uh, individual neighbors and people with their endeavors that look like us um, because I don't think it was uh, subconsciously oh, I'm not gonna support this black person no more because I can get it from a white person I think it was more so of a oh man we couldn't have this stuff from this white people for so long let me go and now show it off even if you think of from a standpoint of being ostentatious like if you look at designers or like who cares about that stuff but the fact of I just saved seven hundred dollars I can get these pair of shoes it shows that I got a certain amount of wealth now like to me that's ridiculous but to other people that's a status that you made it or you're trying to attain a certain level but just remember if those if, if that was a, a situation to where we can fund or channel that seven hundred dollars for that pair of shoes to an african-american business or to reallocate those funds to sustaining our neighborhoods and our own entities opposed to trying to look the part or have a certain type of uh, prestige based on going outside of our realm <laughs> so some of the stereotypes i face is pretty much ones that I often ignore. Um, I don't know how much you can see on the camera, but I'm, you know, five, six tattoos. Um, I typically use a lot of slang, although I'm educated. I got a master's in clinical mental health counseling, um, you know, started some doctoral classes and all that. But for me, I don't believe in art, um, I guess linguistic oppression. Like I don't care about none of that. I'm going to verbalize and articulate the way I want to to ensure that I reach the people that I need to reach. And my demographic is who I'm trying to help. That's that urban guy that's um, I look like his uncle, or you know, I'm getting so many different testimonies based on that. Oh, you remind me of my dad. Like those are the people I'm trying to reach. I'm not trying to reach the person on Wall Street or the person that's already got a prejudiced mindset or subconscious view of what professionalism is. So I'm me as an authentic standpoint. So for me, um, some of the stereotypes that I often see or, you know, get played on, um, you know, is of course I look like a thug or I'm, I'm not of a, a certain caliber just based on the way I dress. I'm always dressed formal. Um, I throw on a shirt and tie every now and again if I want to, not because it's a venue or something that I have to. Um, you know, but that's just me. I don't equate professionalism to a certain dress. I don't equate uh, my linguistic articulation or uh, use of ebonics to um, being more prestige or looking down upon on somebody. Um, I mean, I can use King King's English with the best of them, but I'd much rather be comfortable speaking the way I want to speak. Um, but it, some of the businesses I do have um, put me in places to where I do or need it to go in certain, like City Hall, for example, um, just being there, getting zoning permits or, you know, signing papers as far as um, business licenses and stuff like that. And just getting the views or the eyes looking at me because I was in sweatpants and flip flops or in a T-shirt opposed to being dressed in the, you know, button up shirt and the slacks and a, and a tie like the, the guy beside me. Um, but to me, that had nothing to do with me. You know, what I mean, your ability to perceive me a certain way has everything to do with you. Um, so some uh, most of the times I just pretty much ignore it. Um, and for me, it's I know everything that I deserve and I'm going out there everything I deserve, um, you know, and that's the plan. So is my one of my favorite quotes is definitely if they can feed you, they can starve you. So I try to ensure that I'm in a position to feed myself, feed my daughter and feed my community as best I can. That's why I ensure that I allocate certain resources. I'm out there in the community. I'm being a voice. Um, even though I have the resources, um, I want to ensure that everybody else have those same amount of resources. Um, that's, you know, stereotypes don't really bother me as much. It bothers the people uh, who try to place them upon me because I often ignore them. Uh, being black mean to me, that's a dope question. Being black mean to me is being authentically who I am, um, being in a position to where I'm judged based on the epidermis of my skin. Um, it's dope as hell to be black, um, you know, trendsetter, uh, have to defy certain stereotypes. I'm an active father. You know, my daughter's with me majority of the time. You know, uh, I'm a business owner. I'm 
you know, not in the streets and stuff like that, because there's so much negativity tied towards being black, whether that's the Hollywood perception or whether that's the media or whether that's social media or whether that's just, you know, peers and society basically saying being black is uh, a negative thing. But to me, to be honest with you, being black is like revolutionary. It's it's eclectic. It's artistic. It's the ability to create yourself and express yourself in certain way that people want to, you know, then follow you. And just think about how many trends and how many modes we have broken with less than the uh, other demographics, other ethnicities and stuff like that. So you got to remember, just imagine if a perfect example, um, I was uh, homeless, never, you know, didn't have access to certain information. And I got four properties. Just imagine if I got a million dollar loan like this, you know, other people with their families and stuff like that. Just imagine with my tenacity, with my ambition, how much farther I'll be um, if I was afforded those same opportunities. Just to imagine how much further our demographic would be if our ancestors and the previous generations didn't have to deal with redlining because they couldn't buy a house in certain areas or you know, they couldn't invest in certain things or they got charged a higher rate or different stuff like that. Just imagine how much more we accumulate if they didn't, um, you know, burn down Black Wall Street and in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma and stuff like that. If the Harlem Renaissance wasn't as impactful as it is, like just imagine if it wasn't uh, so much put into suppressing our votes and stuff like that. Like just imagine how, how much further we'll be. Um, if we were afforded those same opportunities and we're not afforded those same opportunities still based on systematic oppression, systematic racism and stuff like that. And we still making strides. So to me, that's way more impressive. So we're neck and neck with less. You know what I'm saying? So just imagine if we had those same opportunities. And I think that part of the fear that plays into uh, what black is like, just imagine if they said, all right, cool. You got a loan based on your credit score. This white person got a loan based on our credit score. Uh, you guys go out and do what you got to do. You know what I'm saying? Just imagine how much more our community would look opposed to uh, the gentrification. Um, so gentrification is cool, but the displacement is not. But just imagine how much more we can gentrify our own neighborhoods and stuff like that if we were afforded those same opportunities, those same leverage. Um, leverages. So to me, being black is awesome. You know, we didn't have the head start. We didn't start in the same place, but we still excelling. You can love your woman, but understand you don't own her. I said you can love your woman, but understand you don't own her. Take off that designer. Build your business and your brand, create your merchandise, wear your merchandise, become an owner, be a master of that slave mentality. The next time you see your brother in the alleyway, say hello, your majesty, reciprocating love and generosity. Look yourself in the mirror and say, ain't nobody stopping me. If we gonna buy the block up like Monopoly, then sip my load to the good times, pinky finger in the air like an apostrophe for my king. My name is Kabe. I am from Richmond, Virginia. Um, I was born at St. Mary's Hospital, but I grew up in the far west end of Henrico. I'm a grants manager for VCU. Uh, so I manage all the grant money, foundation, state funded money that we receive for our programs. I also work as an outreach specialist in the community with the Richmond Food Justice Alliance. Well, so yeah, my, um, my dad's from the country, uh, my mom's from the city, and of course I grew up in the suburbs. Um, so it was an interesting dynamic, interesting household because uh, <laughs> my father is very um, rural, in, even in his like behavior and his life, uh, but my mother is very like quick paced city, city life, and we grew up in an environment, or I grew up with two younger brothers. Um, in an environment that they weren't really familiar with. So I, we had to kind of navigate that environment on our own. Um, I went to school at Shady Grove Elementary and Short Pump Middle School, uh, usually the only black person in my class, just about every year until I got to high school. 
the beginning, you know, um, it's funny because thinking back, I don't think I remember what it was like per se, but I remember um, wanting to be something that, that I wasn't. So at one point I wanted blonde hair and blue eyes. Um, but I don't know that it really impacted me until I got older, more so when I, when I hit probably that puberty stage. My hair was natural, I would wear Afro puffs to school and all the white girls were like, what? I like that hairstyle, you know, what's the, what? I like your hair, can I touch your hair? And so I always felt like um, I was different and unique, but I was, I didn't fit in. So it was an interesting experience. I was probably, so I grew up in the West End, probably my third grade year, I was about nine. Um, so I grew up socializing this environment of white people. Um, and it was the middle class area. It was the area at that time that a lot of folks were moving out to. I don't know if y'all are familiar with like Wyndham and um, just a really nice area. A lot of my friends had really big houses. My parents were working class, middle class. So we had what we needed. Um, we never had a brand new car or anything like that. So it, it felt like, you know, I'm here, but I'm, I, I'm not here. Um, and then all of my family was in the East End of Richmond. And so whenever we would go to the other side of town, you know, there was a different set of rules for my mom of like, you know, making sure that we were home or in the car by dark. Um, I couldn't like walk up to the corner store. Like I wasn't allowed to do certain things because my mother knew that I wasn't familiar with the area. Um, and so as I got older, I always wondered, you know, my cousins were a little different for me. Like they took dance class and I was in like leadership programs and I was on the swim team. And so there was a disconnect. I mean, we were a family and they loved me, but there was always a disconnect that I felt that they lived a different lifestyle than I did. Like I didn't have a group of girlfriends I could run the streets with and be on the step team and just do things that I felt like were centered in blackness. Um, and so I always felt left out. So like, I didn't know the latest dances. I wasn't wearing like the latest Jordans or the latest outfits. Um, I couldn't go to some of the parties, <laughs> like, because my mother just, actually I couldn't go to Churchill at all. So that was like a rule. I could not go to Churchill at all. And now I live in Churchill. So it's, <laughs> it's really ironic because that was one of the areas that my mother forbid, she forbid me to go. And it was partially because of a lot of the violence that was going on in the 90s, but um, also just because she knew I was not familiar with the area and didn't really have anybody in that area that I could call on outside of my family. So to back up a little bit, even though I grew up in the far West End, my parents were very African-centered, like they were very rooted in African culture. So like we had Kwanzaa at our house every year. Um, and so a lot of like my white friends didn't know what that was, but like Bon Caribe and Ron Bagad and you know, anyone, Easy Boo, like anyone that's anyone in African culture or African centered culture of Richmond was at my house for Kwanzaa every year. Um, my mother had books everywhere. I, I watched Roots as a kid, I watched Queen as a kid. So I knew what my history was and actually was brought up to be proud of who I was as an African um, American. But, you know, I still was around white culture so I took Latin <laughs> so and I took Latin for three years and I was the only black girl in class um, but I stayed with you know my class for the, that full three years so I have pictures where it's you know white 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 and then there's me um, and so like I said I grew up learning about my history and knowing I am African-American and I am a black person um, and I also experienced, as I got older, racism from my white counterparts. You, like in the beginning of my school year, it wasn't a lot of that. I mean, you knew you were different, but I didn't experience per se racism that I can remember. Um, it wasn't until I got to high school where I wasn't getting invited to like certain people's houses or I wasn't able to be as close with my white counterparts outside of school as I would like that I noticed there was, there was a reason for it. Um, and so I, I lived, you know, on both sides where, you know, I could code switch and I could be in the company of white people or even other cultures because my parents were all about teaching us 
about other cultures as well. So we went to the, the um, Arabic festival, the Greek festival, you know, all the festivals that Richmond would have, and they would expose us to different foods and different cultures. And so again, I was proud of who I was, um, but when I would come sometimes to the black community, I would um, get my feelings hurt <laughs> because, you know, somebody went, why you talk like that? You talk white. And I was like, well, I don't really know how else I'm supposed to talk. You know, this is how I grew up talking. Um, or, you know, I might not wear, like I said, the latest Jordans. So I might have on like the cute outfit from Clueless. Um, and so people thought I was trying to be white. And that was really tough because growing up knowing that your culture was, you know, Africans were brought over here um, to provide labor for the economic environment um, of the settlers that were here, knowing that I wasn't of that mindset, but people that looked like me didn't feel like I belonged to them. Um, that was hard. That was, that was really hard. So I was thinking when I, when I first saw the what is black um, and answering that question, like, what is black, you know? And though the first thing I thought of was it's an experience. Like, I think black people are so multifaceted, um, good and bad. <laughs> it's an experience, good and bad. Um, we're so full of life and, and our culture is based out of dance and rhythm and movement and, you know, that communal aspect. Um, and so I would say, don't get boxed in. Like we don't have to be what the media has portrayed. We don't have to be what you know um, other people want us to look like because that's what it is. Um, race is a social construct. It was created by white people to keep a certain culture, our culture, black people down. Um, but it, I mean, I've got white friends that are albino, black friends, excuse me, black friends that are albino, um, black friends that have red hair. We're so, it's endless to me. So what I would say to folks is think outside the box. Like don't be so close-minded. That is what some people want us to believe is that black people are only a certain type of people, but we're, we're not. Well, I, I, I do a lot of classes and we talk about stereotypes and so stereotypes sometimes have some truth to them. I will say that, like they're created because of, there is some truth to them, but um, I don't know, Some I've had some thugs get me out of some situations that other folks didn't. And so, you know, I think that everybody has to really look at that person for who they are and what their experience is with them. Um, when I first moved to the to Richmond um, as a single parent of three black boys. The hustler across the street was watching my child when I was at work. So like, and not watching him physically, but like I would get a phone call if, if one of my kids stepped out of the door because he was outside all the time. You know, hey, such and such is outside. Do you want me to tell him to go back in? Or I saw such and such on 35th Street I told him he need to go home because you probably don't know he's out there. And so, and I can go back to my neighborhood where I grew up and white folks will act like they don't even want to make eye contact with me. So I think that you really have to go off of whatever your experience is with a person and not what the media is telling us or what the stereotypes say because one, people change, um, but two, I've actually been less scared of thugs than I am of like other people. So I don't know. I just I don't I don't co-sign to the stereotypes. I get to know somebody for who they are um, first because I also understand that folks that we might look at as being thugs, that's our perception. And where is that perception coming from? You know, is it coming from the media? Is it coming from an experience you had? Is it coming from how you grew up? A lot of people haven't stepped outside of where they grew up. Thankfully, I was exposed to all types of cultures. So I don't look at a Muslim person and automatically think they are a terrorist. You know, I have a lot of Muslim people that um, are in my life that have taught me things, that have helped me through life. And so I don't, I don't see that when I see somebody of that um, ethnicity. I'll go ahead and say an experience, because I think it is. Um, it's a great experience. Um, to know that 
Black people have been through so much and still are here and still are able to be creative and have created um, things that we use every day that are intelligent. Like I see my people as, you know, more than, um, more than what we show. I don't want to get too, like I'm proud of who I am. I'm, like I'm proud of being black and I and I grew up like I said again around a lot of people and so I don't ever my parents never taught me to be disrespectful to any other culture um, you, you know if you have an interaction with a person that's one thing but to blanket be disrespectful um, or hateful to a culture because of what they look like I've, I was never brought up like that um, and so I'm very proud of being black I'm proud of every experience that I've had being black because it's taught me um, I think the resilience that comes from it is just like I feel like I could do anything you know what I mean so um, when the whole world is or it feels like the whole world's against you it's like well I'm just gonna go for I can do anything um, it can be hard because I do have three black sons and the way the world looks at them is very scary um, so, like I said, it's an experience, good and bad. It's scary. Um, I first, I must just be honest, first it's scary. Um, when you carry a child in your stomach for nine months and you see them come out and you've nurtured and, and loved them and you watch every part of their personality and you see someone interact with them differently just off the basis of their skin color, it's very scary. Um, It is really scary. That's I, like that. I don't even know. Like I don't. I don't want to give that too much life. But that's the truth. Um, honestly, in the beginning, I wanted them to be oblivious. You know, like I said, I was rooted in a lot of of history and teaching and so I didn't want to do that since I kind of did the opposite um, and wanted them to just be themselves um, and it wasn't until my son went to school and he started learning about black history and he came home one day and he said I can't be a boss because white people don't want me to be a boss and that was when I realized hold on I need to educate you <laughs> You know, like I've allowed you to be a child and educated you in that form, but now I gotta, I gotta teach you who you are, how special you are, how amazing you are, um, to continue to build your confidence, especially as a barrier for all of what you might have experienced. Um, and so we have talked about, you know, getting stopped by the police and how you carry yourself with the police, or even just, um, I teach them a lot about emotional intelligence to be perfectly honest. I try not to make it too much about race, although my youngest son spends a lot of time with me. And so <laughs> he is like, that's white people do that. And so I, you know, I still correct that because I don't want him to, to generalize people for their skin color. Um, and so even, especially when the police shootings were going on, I, you know, I could just, I, it was like I could see the life leave them in a sense when they're watching this and talking about this amongst um, their friends and so I'm constantly building their confidence and teaching them who they are, where they've come from, um, and that, you know, you're so amazing that somebody wants to stop you. So, yeah. <laughs> um, trying to think, has there been any? We've been really fortunate. Um, my older two live in Baltimore, Maryland, so they're around a lot of black people. Um, they're in the, the city of Maryland, and so, I don't know that they've ever really felt uncomfortable in their skin, but my youngest is here, um, and there's obvious segregation. You can see it in Richmond. Um, and so there's been a couple times he's asked questions, like we go to my mom's house, well, why is it when we go to you know, her house, I can go outside and ride my bike, and um, you know, I don't have to worry about this and that. And you know, so he's seeing the differences, and, and so I'm starting that process of teaching him. But with that teaching, I'm also teaching him how special he is and all of the things that black people have contributed. Um, just 
who was the guy's name that built the railroad? Um, we talked about that and just black, just black, being a black man and how special that is. I don't know how much more, like how I could even drill that anymore, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm in it like this. Never let the teacher tell you you have ADHD. The teacher told me to lower my voice. She said, speak easy. Now I be out here setting legacies with dope bands like on uh, 2nd Street. I'm talking real historic, speak easy, check it. For my kings, I'm from B, A, singing songs, feeling breezy. The little missus love my D and my glow until I say farewell. Check it, I said, I'm from V, A, singing songs, feeling breezy. The Lord Miss, I said, sing your song, Trey song, feel it breezy, Chris breezy. The Lord Missy, Elliot love my D and my glow, D Angelo, until I say, farewell, farewell, love.